real with real entrepreneurs. I am your still sickly co-host, Adrian Graham, CEO and founder of Empowerment Corporation. But you know what? The show must go on, and I'm back this week. Uh, here's my co-host, Stephanie C. Harper, publisher of Career Magazine, who held down the fort brilliantly last week. Thank you so much for coming. I got you, girl. Time. <laughs> and thank you to Anitra if you're watching. Thank you for filling in. I appreciate it. So I was just saying to Stephanie before we went live, I hope nothing gross comes out of my face. So I apologize. Why? I'm coughing or Why? anything. Why? Because <laughs> it's real talk with real <laughs> entrepreneurs. You said you were sick. Keep it moving. Uh, no, but <laughs> working sick is part of being an entrepreneur. How much more real can you get from that? Right. Uh, today's topic, I want, we are going to talk about uh, smart hiring and smart firing. That's not the topic. It's really hire right and fire fast. But a lot of small businesses don't really understand the nuances of what it takes to staff up their businesses, to keep their employees happy, and to compete in the marketplace. You know, there's a big uh, talent wars. Uh, quote that keeps going around saying that you know big companies like the Apples and Facebooks and Nikes of the world have it easier and they could find talent better than small businesses and they're they're better pressed to keep their their employees but it doesn't have to be that way you know if you start out smart from the beginning and get a hiring strategy in place and then from there it doesn't stop you have to cultivate your employees along the way. You have to make a culture so that your people want to stay loyally committed and are not tempted to jump for 50 cents more an hour or the, you know, the allure of a brand new title. Now, while I'll be coming from the recruiting part of it and how to find the right people and things like that, Stephanie comes from the hardcore, what's the word I'm looking for, the compliance side. Of, of the whole human resources because I don't care if you're a two-person shop you have to have a human resources policy in place and Stephanie is the best at it she is number one that is what she does yeah you know her as publisher but that is what she's done and we're gonna start the conversation off first with let's talk a little bit Stephanie about why it's so important for small businesses to take HR serious well what's the purpose of hiring you know, the whole purpose of hiring is growth, right? And so if you don't have the right people in place, then you run the risk of not growing. And that's the whole purpose of hiring. And one of the main things that um, when one of my clients comes to me and says, hey, you know, I, I want to make a hiring decision. The first thing I ask them is, have you planned for growth? Mm -hmm. And their mouth says yes, but the conversation immediately screams no and when you're talking about growth for uh, when you're talking about planning for growth you're essentially looking at your roadmap for success which a lot of small businesses don't do they do um, maybe a business plan because they're looking for funding or maybe a business plan because they've worked with a coach or gone through score or something like that and someone has told them you need a business plan but in that business plan, it doesn't really actually plan for growth. It may say, you know, when do you want to hire? You know, that may be part of your long-term goals or short-term goals, depending on the type of business you have and what you want to do. And a bullet point for goals may be hire an admin or hire, um, you know, a technical person or hire whatever position that business would need. But the planning for growth that I'm referring to is what does that hire look like? And that, I believe, is where many small business owners run into problems because they wait until they have a need to hire. And then it's a rush decision. And both the employee as well as the, or the employer, as well as the job seeker, they're both making rush decisions. You have a small business owner who is in dire need of help and does not have a plan of what to do when they get to this point that they find themselves in. And then you have an employee who is in dire need of employment. And so they jump together, they mesh together, and it's not a good fit. And what many people don't realize is that it costs a lot of money to hire and it costs even more to fire. Mm -hmm. And you know, a lot of people think, oh, it's a right to work state or no right to work state. But if you fire a person without cause, 
you still have to pay them. And that's one of the big, big, big misconceptions that you see. People are like, oh, I can just fire them because I don't, I don't want them here anymore. You can, but if there's no documentation or if there's no, um, nothing that has gone on to justify that firing, you're still going to pay them unemployment. And so it goes back to um, your planning, you know, planning for growth. And I think if more small business entrepreneurs, you know, no, I don't believe anybody opens their business with the intent of, I'm going to do this forever by myself. Mm -hmm. And, but however, they don't, they don't open it with that or, or put it this way, they should not open a business with the intention of I'm going to do this forever by myself. And, you know, you and I both started by ourselves. We took what we knew, we turned it into a business, but of course we had to bring on a team. And it's not my saying, I did not create it, but one of the things that I always say is teamwork is what makes the dream work. And so when you have the proper teams in place, then you can go forward with growth. But Again, as I stated, people don't plan for growth. And I think that's one of the key issues here. Right. Absolutely. Now let's let's back up a little bit and talk about first there's there's so many things I want to talk about, but the one the, the most important things is understanding what kind of employees, team members, staff members, consultants, or whatever. A lot of people think it's so black or white. Either you have an independent contractor or you have an employee. One you pay taxes or one you don't. But it's not that simplistic. No, and it's not. it can get you in trouble, actually. Um, I know, Stephanie, you remember the whole Microsoft story when they misclassified a bunch of 1099ers and got stung by the IRS, yeah. by the federal government. So talk a little bit. Break down the types of employees, I use in quotes, well, employee that they need versus, to look at. Yeah, employee versus independent contractor is really simple. You know, the breakdown is not whether or not you pay taxes or not, which is how a lot of people classify it. Mm -hmm. The breakdown is the relationship and whether or not you're telling them what to do. Point blank. You know, if I am telling you that I need you in my office at 10 a.m., you are my employee. Mm -hmm. Okay? If I am telling you take this project and run with it, you are my independent contractor. And that's where a lot of people get dinged. You know, as you said, they get hit with fines. And let me tell you how big this is for those people who are out there misclassifying their employees. The IRS has a misclassification payback program. What that, <laughs> what that means is if you get dinged and you have all these fines, it has happened so much and so often that they actually have a program that will help you if you have these humongous fines because you have misclassified an employee. So, you know, people very seldom, you know, this goes back to planning for growth. You know, one of the things that people do not have uh, is, you know, an HR professional on retainer or even an HR professional in their circle that they can call and get practical advice from, you know. Now, when you're talking about planning for growth, you have to understand this because guess what? The IRS is not going to say, well, because you didn't know this, I'm going to excuse this. They're still going to ding you. They may give you a warning. They might. Okay. Depends on which IRS agent you're talking to that day, right? <laughs> they might give you a warning. But, you know, because everybody is so hard up for money right now, you know, they're going to say to you, Okay, even though this is your warning, I need this fixed in 10 days. Do you have someone in your immediate circle that can fix it for you in 10 days? Most small business owners do not because it was not part of their plan for growth. And when you're talking about simple things, such as the misclassification, I think a, a misclassification fine is like $3,000 per classification. Don't quote yeah. me on that. But I think it, I know it's per. I don't know exactly what the fine is because I know how to classify employees. <laughs> so I don't have to worry about that. I could look it up for you guys. But you have to keep in mind that these fines are per infraction, 
not per company. So if you have hired six people over the past six years and you've classified them as 1099s, the IRS can come in and they can ding you for each person. So there is a per infraction fee that is, or fine, I should say, that is attached to these kinds of things. And this is why I tell people all the time, do your business and do your business well, but you need to know an HR professional because it's a regulated industry. And I think that's one of the things that, um, that people forget, you know, Jim Stroud and I, who was a very good friend of both Adrian and I, we had a conversation about recruiters um, being regulated. You know, and you and I both know that many people get into um, the HR world. Um, how can I say this? Um, oh, willy nilly. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll go there. You know, it's a situation where you know maybe you are you know an admin or a marketing person or whatever, and HR has an opening or you know you just get hired for whatever the case may be and then HR has an opening and you put in a bid and because that HR manager has worked with you in another capacity um, you know or because you're well liked in the organization or because you've had some um, HR responsibilities you're not necessarily an HR professional but you've had some um, HR responsibilities they go ahead and pull you in and what happens is you learn HR their way whoever is teaching you HR. But just because a person is an HR director or an HR manager, it doesn't mean that they are an HR professional. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a key piece here. I can share with you guys, um, you know, one of the ladies that I worked for one time when I went to work part-time at the hospital, she was the director of benefits and administrate benefit and compliance benefit Benefit Compliance and Administration, I think, was her title. But she did not have a college degree, which is not necessary in HR sometimes, depending on what you do. But my point is, she started at the hospital as a receptionist. That's my point, okay? And she learned what she knows about benefit and benefit compensation and administration. And she's been there 17, 18, 19 years. And so now she is the director. That doesn't take away from what she knows. Okay, it does not take away from what she's learned and how she's educated herself over the past 17, 18 years. My point is how she got into that position. There was nobody else there. She was a faithful employee. They said, okay, we'll give you an opportunity to learn. And they sent her to some training. And, you know, she's been there for X, Y, Z years. She learned under someone else. But in 17 years, she has not gone back to get a degree. She has not gone back to get any industry certifications. You know, you guys see right there, CCP. That stands for Certified Compensation Professional. So I understand Benefit Administration because it was part of my certification. So so when they, of course, saw that on my resume, they were like, hey, get her in here. She's certified at this, which only adds to the credibility of the team and what they're doing. But they didn't need me to do what they were doing. You know, it helped that I had those certifications, but they had been doing, the lady had been doing this 17, 18 years before I ever went to work at the hospital. And so this is the same thing that happens in a lot of, of industries and this is why sometimes human resources has a bad rep you know because you're not dealing with people who like myself I started out as a, an administrative assistant in the HR department so I learned human resources from the bottom up I didn't come in as a recruiter my girl Adrian has a recruiting background so that's not a slam but the point is recruiting is a sales function of human resources Okay, so when you come in at a sales function, you may not understand compensation. You may understand how to put together an offer, but an offer is not a compensation package. And I think that's where, you know, it just gets really convoluted as it relates to what am I doing? Why do I need to hire? What do I need to know when I'm hiring? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times you have, um, job seekers who say, you know, why does the hiring process take so long? You know, it should take long. If a person is telling you, listen, I want to interview you on Friday and I want you to start on Monday, you need to, a red flag needs to go off for you. 
<laughs> because this person nine times out of ten has not done their due diligence as it relates to the hiring process. I get that there is an urgency and I'm not saying that when you get an immediate hire it's an immediate red flag. What I'm saying is you need to make sure that the situation that you're walking into is a good situation for the two of you for the employer as well as the employee. And a lot of times people forget that the hiring process is a two-way street. Mm -hmm. You know, just as an employer is courting you, a job seeker needs to be courting that employer, especially small business owners. When you're talking about your larger companies, they have more procedure and process to protect what they're doing. But when you're talking to a small business owner that does not have proper procedures and process, you might be running the risk of putting yourself into something that you don't want to be a part of. And I'll share another experience with you all. Worked for um, HR manager for a very, 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 very popular hair care company in the Atlanta area. <laughs> okay, so family owned. Okay. What do that is? <laughs> yeah. Mm. Mm. And they didn't. They knew that they were at a point that they needed to get their HR um, under control, but they didn't really want to change anything. And that's where we begin to butt heads. I'm like, look, you know, my certifications are on the line because what what you all may not know is that when you are an HR professional, you have a code of conduct that you have to follow. Again, it is a regulated industry. It's just like a lawyer, a doctor, you know, it's a regulated industry, human resources, okay? But they knew that they needed an HR professional on board to take care of some things, but they did not want to, to change a lot of things, which made it increasingly difficult for me. And I ended up giving my two-week notice because I couldn't hang. I was like, uh-uh. <laughs> because they had so, they, they've been around for so long and they have enough money that if my certifications are stripped from me because of the unethical practices that they're doing, they could move on. Mm -hmm. You know, they've been fined a thousand times and they keep taking the, you know, they, they take a lick and then keep on ticking. That doesn't work for me. You know, if my certifications are stripped, it affects my livelihood. Mm -hmm. So that was a risk that I could not take in my career and it was best that we part ways. But I'll give you an example um, they have a, a corporate office and they have a manufacturing plant. You know, children, it doesn't matter whose child it is. They're not supposed to be on the manufacturing plant, period. But their process is, well, that's my son. It doesn't matter. It's, they're not supposed to be on the manufacturing process, on, on, on the manufacturing floor. And then you have situations where you have summertime help and they want to bring in their son and their friend's son, and their friend's friend's son, that's not how child labor law works. Child labor law is the principal's child, not the friends of the principal. So there's just so many different things that go into bringing people on board. And I'll tell you another thing that they um, would do that would drive me crazy is they have shows. They have really big shows twice a year, and they would want you to put everybody into the payroll system for a weekend show and then take everybody out of the payroll system. And you're talking about upwards of adding to your payroll three, 400 people for a week long event or, you know, a weekend event. And it just, it, that was not the proper way to do that. And, you know, when you go to the owner of the company and you, or the president of the company and you say, listen, there's a better way to do it. And they come back and say, well, that's not how we want to do it. You know, then you have to make some personal decisions. But this, I, I told you that story because this is how a lot of small business owners operate their business. You know, this is how I've done it. This is how it's worked for me. And this is how I want to continue doing it. And sometimes it's not the best, the best practice for your business. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to hiring you have to remember that that person is essentially going to become a brand ambassador for you. And so when you bring on a person, you need to know that this is the right choice for not only your business, but also your brand. Mm -hmm. And I saw your mouth open. You wanted to say something? 
<laughs> no, listen, no, I agree with everything that you said. The thing is, you know, small businesses, we tend to take risks. Well, I'm saying we, I'm not saying we, y'all, you guys, <laughs> tend to take risks that you shouldn't take, you know. And, and like Stephanie alluded to, yeah, I come from the recruiting background, but I have run my businesses for long enough and I've dealt with clients and I've helped them long enough that I understand you know, the confines of HR. I understand the importance of it. I understand what I can do, what I can't do. I don't take unnecessary risks with my business. Um, you know, I'll, I'll share a story that maybe hopefully will scare you guys straight. When I first hired my first employee, I figured, well, I'll have this person work for me, you know, off the books. Not a big deal. And I know a lot of you out there who are watching have said this very same thing. Off the books, you know, it doesn't matter. I don't have to pay any benefits. I don't have to do this. I don't have to do that, whatever, whatever. Well, let me tell you how that backfired on me. This person worked for me for two and a half years. And we parted ways. You know, she was moving on to something else, and you know, which was cool. The next week, she goes and applies for unemployment. Now, I had never reported this person Right. I on my payroll. And I got hit with all kind of inquiries. With They wanted to see me at the Department of Labor. They wanted me to explain how come I had someone and I was paying but not paying taxes. Now, it doesn't matter that I had other people that were legit, that were on there. It's just this one particular person. I still I didn't pay off the books. It's not a big deal, whatever. You guys, as small business owners, you have to understand that whatever you get away with now, it will come back. I didn't do it to intentionally defer. Let me say that so that nobody comes after me because that has been since taken care of, but just so that you're clear, it was not done with the intention of getting over or defrauding. I was helping out a friend who needed to get out of financial trouble. I needed some help and it seemed like a good fit and it blew up in my face. Mm -hmm. As small business owners, we don't have the luxury of taking shortcuts. We can't say, well, we're like Microsoft. We have a million dollar fund in place in case we get fines or in their case, $10 million, whatever it is. We cannot gamble with our businesses. So no matter how cost effective it may seem to you, no matter how, you know, you think, okay, well, this is just a short term, a bandaid fix. I just until I get on my feet or just until I can afford to do this. No, because you cannot afford it. It's like saying, well, I'll hire an attorney when I need one. It's going right. to cost you more money then. When you're running a business, you have to you have to think as a business owner. I don't care if you're a two-person mom-and-pop shop. Eventually, if you have the intention of scaling out and growing and getting more employees from now, you have to put an HR plan in place. HR is not the nosy department that wants to know everything that you're doing. It's right. not the department that's, that's evil, that fires people. It's not the department that slaps your hand or, or restrains you from doing things. It is there for a purpose. Even right. if you have one professional, one HR professional who knows their stuff that can keep you compliant, invest that money in hiring someone who can do that for you or outsource it. There are plenty of, and Stephanie does outsourcing as well. Outsource it to a small company or someone who understands, not just somebody who throws up an HR recruiter or HR consultant banner or someone who says, hey, I'm a recruiter, but by the way, I do HR. You can't do that. Right. I can recruit all day long. I can do compensation all day long. I'm not a benefits analyst. I'm not a payroll coordinator. I don't do anything with unions or anything like that. So while it falls under HR, it would be a misrepresentation for me to say, I can do your HR consulting. I don't do that. So when you're, you're sitting down, you're thinking about how to spend your dollars. And, and I got this a similar question on the Ask Adrian segment about when do I know when to staff up or whatever or how to put my money. You know, a lot of people say either put money into hiring a good sales team or put money into your marketing. I agree to certain levels, depending, but your first hire should be somebody who can keep you legal, someone who can keep you compliant, 
who right. understands. If they happen to know some recruiting, that's great. If they happen to understand benefits and payroll, that is great. But you need someone who can get in there who understands the HR landscape and the HR policies in your state. Right. You need to understand that. It is an expense. It is an investment. It's not an expense. It's an investment. And you need to take it very serious because whatever you did five years ago, ten years ago, trust me, somebody is watching and something will come up where the IRS or the federal government or somebody is going to come and say, wait, 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 wait. We need to look at this a little bit more closely. And you're going to get in so much trouble. And then on top of that, there's something called retroactive fine. So if you did something in 2002, and this is 2013, and they're just finding out, it's not just you're getting fined for messing up today. You're getting fined for 11 years back. Right. So, and you could be potentially put out of business. So right. stop and ask yourself this question. Is it worthwhile for me to take shortcuts with my business like that that can put my entire business in jeopardy? If you're a sole entrepreneur, sole um, owner of your company, keep in mind, you don't have a cushy corporate entity backing you up. You don't have a multi-million dollar fund in place. They're coming after you. They're shutting down your business. They're taking all of your assets. They're taking your home potentially. So hear me when I say that you have to take this very serious when you're thinking about staffing for your business. You got to follow the letter of the law. No matter how attractive a shortcut may be, it's not always the best thing to do. So right. I want to move on actually to something that, that Stephanie said a little earlier about understanding the positions that you need to hire because this kind of segues into that. A lot of times people will say, I need an admin or I need a marketing person or I need a bookkeeper and throw out an ad on Craigslist, which is the bane of my existence, or they'll throw up a, a, a job announcement on Twitter or whatever. They have no clue what they really need. And they also don't understand how to scale that. You know, for this amount of business, I need this amount of employee. And a lot of us small, you small business owners out there, you don't stop and think about that. Now, you may be saying, I, it's two, three years before I have to hire. But now, today, is when you need to sit down with your pen and your pad and whoever is on your team and start plotting out your growth. Stephanie, talk a little bit about helping people understand why it's so important to have accurate job descriptions and realistic job descriptions is what I really should say. Well, it goes back to, you know, uh, the money factor. Time is money, right? And going back to the things that go into hiring, you know, yes, I can sit here and I can tell you, okay, I'm going to hire um, an HR or not an HR, but an administrative assistant. And I'm going to pay them $15 a year or $15 an hour, which is 30,000 a year. Right. Mm -hmm. But if I have to spend X, Y, Z time training them, then I'm really not getting my $15 an hour because I'm doing their work. Okay. I shared with you guys, publicly, you know, many of times when I left corporate America, I was making more than $80,000 a year. So it does not benefit me to do anything for $15 an hour. Mm -hmm. And if I'm relegated to sitting there and training with someone, now don't get me wrong, at any company, there's going to be a learning curve. I'm not talking about your learning curve. I'm talking about when you hire someone and, um, I, I just thought about a conversation I had with Anitra the other day about someone who was submitting um, something for an international trip and they put on there that they were fluent in English, uh, fluent in Spanish. And yeah, anyways, but they weren't fluent in Spanish when the interview came down to it. But anyways, long story short, um, when you're talking about bringing people on board and that training factor is involved. If you have to spend a week training someone on basic things, then you have essentially shut your business down for a week and relegated yourself to a $15 an hour employee. And when you take that $15 an hour and you divide it by two, because that's two people who are not being productive, you're looking at $7.50, right? 
is that what your time is worth? And so if you do not have a clear understanding of what that person needs to do for you, i.e. a written job description, then when you set out to look for that person, you're not going to find the right person because you're not clear about what you actually need. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that uh, a question that comes up a lot of times with my clients is, do I need to hire full-time or part-time? Well, that goes into the truth of your business need and going back to planning for growth. You know, many people will say, oh, I need a, a part-timer because they think that's all that they can afford. Mm -hmm. That may not be necessarily true. Okay. You may need to hire a full timer with less experience, or you may need to hire a part timer with more experience, depending on what you need. Because the, in, the reality is, if you cannot afford to pay someone at a higher level, and we're going to go for an admin, we're going to take the $15 an hour as the higher level for the sake of conversation. At $15 an hour, a person needs to do, be able to do more than the basic admin stuff, okay? So maybe you want to hire someone who's at a higher salary, but bring them in only part-time mm -hmm. because your need is a little bit higher. If you hire someone at $10 an hour, don't expect for them to be able to run your business when you're out of the office because that's not their skill set and that's not what they're there for. Now, yes, we know that people try to get away with the other duties as needed bullet, mm -hmm. but that's not realistic, okay? If your employee doesn't understand, and mind you, we're talking about a new hire, okay? That new hire does not understand your customer yet. That new hire does not understand your culture yet. That new hire may not even understand your business yet. So you cannot bring in a $10 an hour employee who has very basic skills and expect for them to handle things while you're out of the office and then be upset because they can't. That's not their skill set. That's not their genius. And so that's not what they're able to do for you. The reason why you don't know that is because you didn't have a realistic expectation. And I'll give you an example. Um, you know, I had a client who needed to hire an, an admin, and it was very important that there. this was a, a dental office, a client of mine that's a dental office. It was very important that the person understood medical billing. I mean, um, yeah, medical billing. Now, duh, that's like a given, right? A, a dental office is billable, okay? She had a an office manager that she was paying $40,000 a year. Why does your office manager, who you're paying $40,000 a year, not understand medical billing? Mm -hmm. Why do you keep hiring medical billing people when all your office manager is, your office manager has the title of office manager and has the pay of office manager, but she's really an overly compensated receptionist. Mm -hmm. Because really all she did was greeted people when they came in. She had this really nice little office. She greeted people when they came in. She sent them over to the receptionist. Why? She had just greeted them when they came, the way that the office was set up, they walked into her first and then she had to buzz them into the other little office where the receptionist would then verify whether or not their coverage was valid and get them set up. And then they would transfer them over and then they would come back. And after they've had their service and the, the coverage has their medical information, their insurance has been verified. Then after the person has the service, then you have yet another person doing medical billing. It would have been very wise for my client to send her office manager to learn medical billing. Mm -hmm. That's what her $40,000, uh, as an office manager, she needs to be able to manage every process in that office. So when you put out office manager, <laughs> and you know I'm sure we'll get into this about inflated titles, Mm -hmm. Okay. When you give someone the title of office manager, that means that they can manage every single function in your office. Doesn't mean that necessarily she had to be the one to do it, but she should have known how to do it. And she should have been able to train not only the receptionist, but also, you know, some of those other people that were floating around the office that weren't doing anything.
You know, there was no reason for her to be outsourcing, outsourcing, of course, and then I'm doing her payroll for her. And I'm like, wait a minute, we need to streamline. My suggestion to her was to get rid of her office manager altogether and find an office manager who, who needed, I mean, who was abreast in medical billing as well as payroll because those were her main two needs. There was no need for her to have three different positions doing those three different functions. Mm -hmm. This was a, a lady she didn't want to terminate. Okay, well, if you don't want to terminate her, then get her the training because it does not make sense. And anything that the office manager could not do, her suggestion was we need to hire. We need to hire. So this Dennis, who is currently... Um, you know, her business is really, really struggling, you know, because she has all this top heavy, she has top heavy personnel that she does not need. She needs to effectively train her personnel. Now, you know, she wants to continue to pay me to process her payroll. Fine. I've done an HR consultancy with her. I've told her what she needs to do to streamline her business. But if she wants to struggle, I'm going to get mine. Because I've done my due, due, due diligence with her in terms of letting her know how she can streamline. If she doesn't want to take my advice, that's her decision as a business owner. But I've told her, listen, I can show you right now how to save $70,000. Get rid of the $40,000 a year office manager who's not managing your office mm -hmm. and get rid of the billing person who is not billing. You know, you need, that's two salaries that you don't have to pay because you know what? And then of course she has an offsite accountant. So what is the office manager doing? Yeah. She's not, you know, so of course, when I go in to do the HR um, consultancy with her, which was a staff check, I'm looking at job descriptions and none of, I'm looking for job descriptions and nobody has job description. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. again, this is something that your office manager could have gotten offline and even had a basic job description. Now, that but doesn't also, mean a complete job description, but a basic job description. Right. But we also have to be careful with that, too, because what I'm finding, and this is, this is strictly from the recruiting side of it, is it kind of melds into the whole job advertising category. First, let me just say this. A job description is not a job ad. Can we please? I've been saying that for 20 years. A job description is not a job ad. You don't cut and paste and say, hey, we're hiring. Look, this is what we're hiring for and paste it into a job ad. It doesn't Correct. work. Second thing is what, what Stephanie touched on is the redundancy and the overlap. When you're sitting down, yeah, you can go online and get job description templates or whatever, but nine times out of ten, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm a gambler. I'm going to say nine times out of ten, the person who downloads those job descriptions, leave them as is, maybe change one or two things, and Correct. use that as their job description, and don't really understand what it is that the position really needs or Correct. does. And that leads to a lot of the redundancy and the overlap. You know, it's, I don't want to see, you know, when, when I sit down and do my job descriptions, they come from here. I look at my survey, what I need. Okay, let's say I need a marketing person. What do I need this marketing person to do? I don't want the traditional conventional job description that's out there right. on the web to tell me what I need. I have very specific needs for right. each position. So I think where, where small businesses fail is that we don't get very, you guys don't get very specific about what it is that you need. Sit down. Nobody's saying you have to create a thousand word description or whatever. Right. It, I've seen the most succinct job descriptions be four lines long and, and hit everything that they needed. You have to sit down and really do a gut check and figure out what exactly does this person do? How do they contribute to the team? What is their effectiveness on the bottom line? And how much is it going to cost me to have this person? Um, I, I can share another story. Like, Stephanie, I had a client that came to me and said, I need a CFO. <laughs> now, when you guys hear CFO, you think six-figure salary, big money, you know, CFO's big responsibility. You're basically managing the finances for the entire company. This guy, excuse me, got to keep it real, this fool told me, and I want the person at $45,000 a year. Not going to happen. Thank you. And I looked at him, I said, do you actually know what 
a CFO does. Yeah, I know a CFO does it. He broke it down to me and said, and on top of that, I need someone who can get out there and work on my behalf to get investor funding. $45,000 a year. I said, what you need is a finance manager. You don't need a CFO. Is what you're right. looking for. And you need to have your partners bone up on their, their skills, their fundraising skills, because a CFO should not be out there raising money for a company. Correct. And uh, yeah, you know, a lot of a lot of small businesses will, you know, get a two for one and say, "Well, I, if I can kill two birds for one stone with one stone, I'm gonna have this person do this, 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 and this." And by the way, this, 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 and this doesn't work that way. No, nope. you can't do that. You can't ask someone to say, "I need you to handle my marketing." By the way, I need you to design all my marketing collateral. I need you to do my web design, and I need you to do my search engine optimization. That doesn't work unless that person is skilled in all of that. And if right. that person is skilled in all that, trust me, you have to come out of pocket and pay what this person is going for. There's right. a site that you guys can look at, um, payscale.com. And it's the first thing I do when I send my unrealistic clients to bring their little helium heads down out the stratosphere to get them to understand what the current market rates are for different salaries. To get the current rates, you have to understand the job descriptions. You have to understand the titles and what functions fall within these titles. So go to payscale.com the next time you're thinking about setting a salary for or a range and just research or go on the job boards and see what other people are paying. You got to understand as employers, you should never be in a position to say, well, it's an employer's market. We call the shots because really, no, we don't. The talent calls the shots. And the sooner you get that through your head and the sooner you, you accept that and understand that, the better you can sit down and actually plan out what exactly you need for your company, what types of positions, how many people, at what intervals. I have a, a, a sample uh, staffing plan that if you guys want, just email me, info at empowerme.org. And I sit down with all of my clients, and we before we even talk about any job openings, we write a plan out. We figure out, we chart the growth, we chart what the need is going to be. And this is, is very basic, and of course i got to strip some stuff out of it because my paying clients use those. But I'll, I'll give you guys the generic version of it and keep that and use that to kind of outline, even if you haven't hired yet, outline your strategy for how you want to hire for your business. So I just had to share, share that because you guys, you want the moon and the stars, but you only want to pay the value that does not right. work. <laughs> right. And I think we need to also, um, Adrian, talk about some of the legal risk mitigations because, mm -hmm. you know, we talked about a little bit about, you know, employee or independent contractor, but also, mm -hmm. you know, do you have agreements in place? You know, mm -hmm. do you have, especially small business owners, you know, you must have code of conduct, you must have, um, you know, non-disclosures, you must have those things, you know, now non-compete, you know, usually that's for sales personnel and it's kind of iffy because you can't tell somebody that they can't use, um, you know, sales tactics in a, in a two-year mm -hmm. period, which is basically what a non-compete does. But, you know, if they sign it, whatever, they got to deal with it. But you have to have certain types of agreements in place. Having an employee handbook, you know, I tell all businesses, no matter how large or small you are, you need an employee handbook. Not only does that set a clear expectation for you to give to your employee in terms of what you expect from them, but it also protects you. You know, when your employee does not do what you said to them, these are my expectations, then you cannot hold them accountable if you have not put the expectations out there. Um, and then, of course, you, you must understand wage and hourly laws. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't have a person, you know, you can't tell a person, okay, fine, see you on Friday and then be texting them all weekend long and think you're not going to pay them for it. So, you know, those are some some legal things that small business owners fall, you know, legal legal risk mitigation, um, things that, that small business owners fall into because they just simply don't understand those things. Right. And they're so focused on their business that they don't think that they have to even worry about those things, mm -hmm. which, of course, is not true. But another thing... Um, you know, that I wanted to talk about is the reach, you know, mm -hmm. what, how are you finding these people? 
okay so let, let's kind of move from from legal into the reach you know mm -hmm. when you're talking about the reach I think one of the most common ref, uh, one of the most common things for small business owners is employee referrals or friend referrals you know we tap into our databases and we all know that you know people hire people right and sometimes it's not what you know but who you know we know all of that but I think as it relates hello. to hello granny <laughs> I know. Everybody's good. That's my 102 year old grandmother. Real talk, real entrepreneurs. Um, one of the one of the things that you find is that's a common practice, but I don't know if it should be the best practice. I think it's great to say, do you know anybody? Because again, you know, putting an ad is expensive. You know, um, putting an ad in the paper, putting an ad on a job board, all of those are costs that you know, a small business owner may not want to occur or in, in, uh, accrue. Mm -hmm. But if they want to, you know, with social media, we have a lot more reach than we had 10 years ago. You know, it's a lot easier to go into a particular group or a particular um, forum and say, hey, I'm looking for someone. Do you know anybody? And that's okay. But I still think that when people are referred to you, that you need to do your due diligence. Don't just say, oh, because Adrian referred this person to me, I'm going to hire them because of my relationship with Adrian. No, you still need to do your due diligence. Mm -hmm. Now, you also have to think about job boards. You know, is this the right avenue for a startup? you have to make that determination based on where you are one financially two you know people can be whoever they want to be online and if you're not abreast um reading resumes and understanding red flags in a resume then you might get suckered in you know i i don't know if any of you have been watching this new show out called the job but um the late i think it was the cosmopolitan issue where um the lady told her, you have um, a foreign language on your resume. And she started speaking to her in a foreign language and the girl could not respond back to her. So I think, I think that was the Cosmopolitan issue um, episode. I can't remember. But anyways, um, you know, we talked a little bit about social media. And then, you know, I, I feel like, you know, tapping into your network is one of the best ways to find talent not necessarily the best way to hire talent. And I think that is the difference. Mm -hmm. Well, this is my part to jump in here because, um, first of all, it's not a secret that I hate job boards. Anybody who's worked with me, any clients who know me knows I hate job boards because they're so antiquated. Here's a problem. You know, when we're when when recruiters, hiring managers, staffers, whatever you want to call them, are charged with filling a position, there's so many people and I'm not gonna get into the whole backdrop of that, but there's such a rush to what where can I post it, what job where, who can I tweet it to, who can I send it to? And it's just a matter of reach, as Stephanie says. I'm gonna disagree with that because I don't believe in reach. I believe in reach to the right people. And a lot of people, a lot of you out there are saying, well, I have 20,000 people on Twitter that are following me, so somebody will see it in there. Or I have 1,200 people on Facebook, somebody will see it in there. That's not the effective use of your reach. You need to be going where the talent is. That's a whole other lesson itself, and you've got to pay me for that information. So I'm not going to get too deep into that. But that number one, go where the talent is. And if you don't know how, you better learn how to do it because you're going to miss out. Second thing is you need to have some sort of organizational system in place. There is no longer any excuse to just be taking resumes by email, keep them stored in your Yahoo uh, folders and all of that. Invest in an applicant tracking system. Note I said applicant tracking, not applicant ignoring system. Because we all, we all know a lot of recruiters out there get these systems and it's like, oh, I don't have to talk to people. They can just submit their resumes and that's it. No. An applicant tracking system is something that you can use. It can be cloud-based. They don't, they don't do any more software anymore where you have to install anything. 
uh, Taleo Cats, um, Zoho Recruit is another one. There are uh, several of them on the market that are a little bit costly, but they're well worth it. It keeps your job search organized. It keeps your database of employees. It lets your hiring manager stay in the loop with the process, and it lets you be able to have candidates have that feedback if you choose to use it right to see what's going on with the process. So that's what an applicant tracking system is. It's not just a resume dump. It is a true tracking system in every sense of the word. Invest in one of those. You need to get that to manage your process. Um, as a matter of fact, I don't take email resumes anymore. And whenever someone tells me, well, I have to refer someone, I don't let them do that. They go straight to my applicant tracking system, and they do it the right way. So the next thing is, that, like Stephanie touched on, the employee referral program. A lot of you don't know how much power you have in an employee referral program. When you're working with your recruiter, first, let me back up. The best way to cut expenses for third-party recruiters, and, and I know I'm technically one, but I'm more of a consultant, but the best way to save your money where you're not paying 30% fees, 25% fees, or whatever it is, because it's expensive to use now a, a, a third party agency. Yeah, 40%, isn't it? Isn't it 40%? It's 33 uh, is, is the, the high end. Is yeah, 30. so think about a person who is being paid a $40,000 salary. That's exactly. an eight grand commission. Exactly, exactly. So if you want to avoid that, first of all, get a good recruiter in place that you can hire on site or go to someone who knows what they're doing. Hello. But, um, and no, don't, don't call me because I only deal with technology and engineering. So all that other stuff I don't deal with. But get an employee referral in place. If you're treating your employees right and your employees are truly happy to work with you, which is something I don't know if we have time to touch on, on culture, but if you're building the right culture in your company, your employees will be more than happy to recommend people to work for you. Right. It doesn't have to be anything big. You can have something. We uh, ADP was a client of mine, and we used to do these these quarterly things where we had these races or these these incentives or contests for people to recommend people and refer people, and they had different prizes and opportunities. You can do it as small or as elaborate as you want to. Just don't walk in and say, "Hey, guys, you know anybody?" Make it incentivize it for your employees incentivize them for referring people to come to work for you because that's your that's your first line of defense even before your recruiters your employees are your first line to finding new talent and if you're not tapping those people you know it's not going to work and then the final piece of that is network get out there and network talk to other small business owners talk to people in your industry and figure out where the people are and get recommendations that way what I do you know I, I have a love-hate relationship with social media and people think I'm a guru no I just use it very well but I use social media not to broadcast because you hardly know when I'm looking if I'm working on an independent project for someone who needs say like a CFO or whatever you're not gonna see that on my Twitter feed you're not gonna see that I use social media as a detective tool. I pay attention. I listen to the conversations. I pay attention to what people are talking about. I look for the thought leaders. I look for the people who seem to be skilled. And I engage them in conversation, even if it's just slight banter or whatever. I get to know the people. And that's my opening. It lets me get them comfortable with me. I get comfortable with them and get to see a little insight into them. And then that opens the door for a referral relationship. So when you're using social media, don't look at it in terms of let me tweet out these jobs. You know, yeah, I do the Tweet Me Tuesday on, on Tuesdays as a courtesy. It's my, my way of giving back. But that's not the real power is not in that when you're using social media. The real power in social media is paying attention and being engaged and if you don't have time to do that you don't have time to use it to recruit that's just the the common sense the point blank you know period end of statement on that one so there are different things that you guys can do to make sure that you're looking for people in an effective cost-effective manner there are different things you can do to make yourselves more organized and please just just think about it in terms of not what's it gonna cost me to post a job or what's it going to cost me to, to outsource to this agency? Think about it in terms of how can I build the best kick-ass team possible for my business? When you look at it from that perspective, instead of I need bodies and spaces, your staffing experience is going to be so much better, so much more rich and fulfilling. 
So right. that that's what I wanted to say about the recruiting thing. Anything further than that, info at empowerme.org, and you can get a consultation. But anyway, before we, we wind down, I want to talk about firing, Stephanie, because that's something that a lot of small business owners are afraid. They are definitely scared of firing people because they don't either want to hurt feelings or, like in the case of your client, don't want to get rid of somebody that they've known a long time. But... I'm here to tell you it's very real. When you see that your money, your business is hemorrhaging money or you're suffering in productivity, you'd be firing like Donald Trump in no time. So right. Stephanie, well, talk a little bit about the implica impl implications of not firing fast enough. You know, it really goes back to, um, you know, setting your, your realistic hiring expectations, you know. Mm -hmm. You're going to be faced with things if you make some of the following, some of the mistakes in your hiring. You know, a couple of those mistakes would be, you know, if you're not communicating the value proposition for working with you. You know, another one is, of course, we talked about legal responsibilities, but one of the main mistakes, I think, is interviewing without a plan. And that plan includes what if this hire does not work? You know, you need to have, again, as part of your planning for growth, you need to have an exit strategy in place. And that is for that employee who does not work out. And if you have a job description, it becomes pretty much a checklist for you mm -hmm. to say, is this person meeting what I said I needed? I needed someone who could do A, B, and C. If you look at that checklist and you look at what the employee is doing, it's very easy to say, yes, they're meeting my needs, or no, they're not meeting my needs. When you look at your bottom line, if you brought somebody in to increase your revenue and it's been 90 days, 180 days, and your revenue has not increased, they have not met your needs. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. You have 30 days in which um, you're kind of, Free. Well, let me put it this way. Depending on what your process is and depending on what your policy is, you might have 30 to 90 days depending on what your probationary period is, which again is why you need to have this outlined in your employee manual. Ding, 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 ding. See how this works? So if your um, probationary period is, let's say, 90 days, and mind you, you can extend that probationary period. But if the person is still in their probationary period, that's the easiest way to terminate without, um, without backlash, mm -hmm. okay? You just say, we're in our probationary period. It didn't work out, okay? But if you do not address the situations that are going forth mm -hmm. during the probationary period or you keep them on past the probationary mm -hmm. period knowing that there's issues and nothing has been documented, this is when you run into that, well, I'm afraid to fire them because they know this or that about me, or I'm afraid to fire them because now I may have to pay, or I'm, I'm afraid. And this goes back to understanding right to work versus non-right to work because a lot of people do not understand what that means. Um, and again, they say, well, I can just terminate you. You know, there, there's a law out there, you know, we're in this kind of state or that kind of state, and I can just terminate you. And as I said earlier, yes, you can, but that doesn't mean that you will not be paying them unemployment. Okay, so if they've passed your probationary period, or if you have no probationary period in place, you're nine times out of ten, you're trying to get rid of that employee, but guess what? You're still going to be paying that employee. So when it comes to hiring and firing, you know, it's a decision that affects your bottom line because guess what? You still have that need, right? Mm -hmm. So if you hire the wrong person and have to terminate them, then your process starts all over again. The time that you spend looking for someone, the time that you spend interviewing someone, the time that you spend training someone, those are processes that you cannot afford to continue to do over and over and over because it affects your bottom line. So, you know, when you're talking about, you know, people being fearful of firing, don't be fearful. If it's not a good match, nip it in the bud, get it out the door, get the person on their way, let them go because it affects your bottom line and you're not in business to be friends. You're in business to make money. So, you know, Adrian and I have this um, 
we've had conversations about hiring friends in business. You know, I'm not I'm not completely against it, but it's not my first choice either. Mm -hmm. You know, I have some really powerful friends who I know know their stuff. So would I hire them as an employee? Maybe not. Would I hire them as a strategic alliance partner? Definitely. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and that's the difference. You know, if I said, Adrian, um, I need for you to find me a blase, blase, blase for either Step Enterprises or for Career Magazine, I would not go to her with an employee mindset. Mm -hmm. I would go to her and say, okay, Adrian, I'm coming to you as a strategic alliance partner, and this is what I need for you. What are your fees? And I would expect for her to, one, treat me just like she would any other client. Mm -hmm. I would expect for her to charge me just like she would any other client because it's not about our friendship. You know, if she wants to say, hey, you know what, I'm not going to charge you the XYZ fee, that's her call. But I would not contact her for a service that I know that she provides expecting for her to give me a discount because of our relationship. It doesn't work. <laughs> you might, <laughs> you, you know, but again, you know, as I said before, money is not always the only way to, 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 to do payment. Mm -hmm. So Adrian and I have enough that we can share resources between each other. But my point being for the larger good, you know, mm -hmm. if you're going to someone who does that for a, um, who does that because it, this falls right along with hiring, you know, even the people that you use part of your team, you know, people mm -hmm. need to understand that sometimes you don't need to hire. You need a strategic alliance partner. Sometimes you just need a virtual admin to do something for you. Sometimes you need a part-timer. Sometimes you need a full-time hire. This again goes back to your planning for growth. And if you have a written planning, planning for growth process, then when it comes to the firing, it's a simple decision because it's not a personal decision. It's a business decision. And when you're making that decision based purely on your production, your projections for growth and your planning for growth processes, then it's <clears throat> extremely easy to make that determination. Is mm -hmm. this working for my business? Is this not working for my business? Is this working for my bottom line? Is this not working for my bottom line? And if you're getting a resounding no, then it's time to terminate. Mm -hmm. It's time yeah. to terminate. Yeah, and that's the problem. We we put too much emotion into it, and and I want to I want to kind of wind down with what happened over the last week. I know you guys, if you read the business news, know about Andrew Mason from Groupon, CEO that was fired. Um, you know, a lot of times small business owners, we, we feel like, especially when you're a startup, because you have that core team that was there from Jump Street and there from the beginning and kind of saw the evolution of the company and you feel beholden to them. And it, it's, I don't like having friends and family work with me. I made one exception. My mother is my office manager. One, because I know she ain't going nowhere. And number two, I know she ain't gonna steal my money. So, and I know where she lives. She lived with me. So it's not a big deal. But, you know, as far as like if cousins or anything came to me and said, hey, look, I need a job. No, I, I'm not in the business of hiring relatives. Do I give back and help my family? Yes, absolutely. One has nothing to do with the other. So as a small business owner, you have to take that personal side and put it to the background so that you can function as a business owner. When you start running your business from your heart, and, and I'm going to need a lot of slack for saying this. When you start running your business from your heart and your emotions and you take every sad story, you take every, you know, every, every um, situation and it's like a pet project, it's going to be that much harder when it's time to fire. Because I'm going to tell you, it's not cute when your business is hemorrhaging money and you know that the biggest expense is also, also the same person that's making you lose money. It's not so cute. You know, this is a business. Just like Stephanie said, business is business. You can laugh and chit chat on your own time. Business is business. And that includes hiring and firing people. Now, Andrew Mason, uh, for those of you who don't know, he was the CEO of Groupon. And we all know I have issues with Groupon because I don't like the whole, the way they make small businesses basically have to give away tons for scraps of money. I, I just don't like the business model. That's personal. 
Not saying it's not good as a consumer, but as a business owner, I don't think it's an effective business model. Anyhow, this past weekend, he sent out an email or a post or something saying, I was just fired from Groupon, you know, the company he started. And basically, the, the, the crux of it was Groupon was getting to a point where they needed adult supervision, adult supervision. And Andrew was not, he, he's, he's an entrepreneur. He is a business starter. He's not a business operator. He didn't have the skills in place to run and grow and scale the business. And yeah, this is an example of someone at the top level because it's not always the receptionist or the admin or the bookkeeper or the marketing person. Even at the very top end, you can get fired. If you, the minute you take money from outside investors, you as the CEO put yourself directly in the path to be fired if you don't produce. Right. So hear me when I say you, you have to understand that it's whatever's best for the bottom line up to and including firing the CEO of the company has to take precedence. And it's not a personal decision. It's a business right. decision. Although Andrew Mason did step on a lot of toes and I think that firing was a little bit personal. But that's just an example of he's not the right fit to take the business to the next level. He got a fat compensation package out of it, you know, a, a, a separation package, but that's neither here nor there. But you have to understand that your business, this is how you eat. This is how your livelihood is, is contingent on your livelihood, and this is how you pay your bills and support your family. You cannot run your business the same way that you run your family. You cannot let emotions get into it. You need to figure out what the problem is, identify the cause, get it fixed, or you got to cut it loose right away, and you have to fire. And I hate to even mention the T word, but just like he says, you got to know when to say you're fired and can't look back. You cannot right. feel sorry about it. The first time I had to fire somebody, I cried. I cried an entire week. I didn't, and as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, it's so funny, and I can share this because I'm I'm grown enough to share this. When I was firing this person and I had them in my office, I was in tears. It ended up with me hugging the person. She, you know, hugged me and was like, it's going to be okay or whatever. It hit me harder than it did her, that I had to fire her. <laughs> okay? But today, in 2013, don't expect to see the little tear. I may cry behind the scenes if I have to do something, but as a businesswoman, I know what it takes to run my business. I know what efficiencies need to be in place, and I'm not afraid to say you don't fit the culture of this company or you are not contributing to my bottom line. And as a business owner, that's how you have to be. You cannot waver on it. You can't let them, let you, let them, let them see you with a moment of weakness because it's about running your business. If you're serious about growing and becoming a, a contender in your field, you got to play the game with strategy. And with that comes making the hard decisions, and that means sometimes firing the people. So that's all I have to say. Stephanie, you want to wrap this up? After, after being in human resources for more than 20 years, I don't have a problem firing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a problem firing you with a straight face or a smile on my face, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not, um, you know, but again, you know, if this is not something that you want to do as a small business owner, or if, if it's not something that you're comfortable doing as a small business owner, mm -hmm. you can always call me and hire me on a retainer, right? <laughs> and I can help you with that process. But Call me to hire her to fire. <laughs> <laughs> right. But the, the, the truth of the matter is, it's not easy for everybody because again, you know, as you were saying, if you're doing business with your emotion, you're looking at, oh my gosh, you know, that person just had a baby or, oh my God, that person just bought a house or that person just bought a car or whatever. That's not your issue. It's not your problem. Um, you know, I'm not saying don't have compassion. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying at the end of the day, you know, you have to make sure that your bottom line is is secure. And I'm going to tell you guys something that Adrian and I, um, we're, we are accountability partners and we talk to each other about, you know, life, about business, about our husbands. We talk about a little bit about everything. But one of the conversations that Adrian and I had early this year, believe it or not, is about firing ourselves. 
and putting together um, exit strategies for our business, you know. And so one of the things that we're even talking about is, you know, who's going to hold up the bloodstained banner for us, you know, when we decide that we've gotten to a point where this is no longer an effective use of our time. Mm -hmm. Not to say that neither of us like what we do, but we're talking about from a business perspective. You know, there's so many things that Adrian and I want to do on a grander level than what we're currently doing now. And so we are at, we're at a point where as accountability partners, we're putting together processes to fire ourselves from our own businesses. Mind you, I said fire ourselves. I did not say close our businesses. Okay. We're talking about putting people in place and training up teams that can run our legacies for us and make sure that what we've done and what we've created and what we've instituted can live on even though we want to move on to some other things. We have much bigger dreams than what we're doing. So those of you who think, who think that we're doing you know, outstanding things now, we thank you for that compliment, but that's not enough for either of us. You know, we're very, um, both of us are very high strong. We have huge things that we want to do mm -hmm. on the horizons. And what that means is that we have to get out of these current seats that we're sitting in now in order to do that. And so again, that planning for growth. And I know that my growth process has to do with me getting out of this chair. You know, and I'm not talking about this physical chair, but I'm talking about the chair that I'm, that, the hats that I'm wearing, my, my personal growth, because you guys know I've shared a million times. I've done pretty much everything I set out to do in my career. There's probably three things on my career path that I haven't done, but pretty much the things that I've set out to do in my career, I've done. And let me just put a plug here and say when I'm talking about career, I'm talking about Webster's definition, that continued progressive pursuit in a field. Okay, I'm not talking about working for somebody. I'm talking about your career path. Even though Adrian and I both own our own companies, we still have a career path. So that's what I'm talking about. And even though you are a small business owner, you still have a career path. So when I say career, I'm not talking about working at, you know, a Fortune 500 for 20 years and that means you have a career. I'm talking about Webster's definition of what a career is, which is progressive, continuous pursuit in your field. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so as you're talking about hiring and firing other people, you also have to look at someone who can, who has, you know, the same brand attributes as you, you know, and that's key when you're hiring them, because if they have the same brand attributes as you, this may be the person who, when you're ready to fire yourself, can take over for you. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And might I say, I'm on the clock, the countdown, 18 to 24 months, um, I'll be stepping down from the reins from Empower Me. I'll be installing myself as chairperson, but stepping away from the day-to-day -day duty. So, you know, like Stephanie says, you can't, you can't be afraid to fire yourself because you have to, as a business owner, you have to know that you must do whatever is best for your business. Right. If it means that Okay, me as CEO, I bought my company here, but I can't get it here without help. Then that means that I have to find somebody that can take it from here to here. And that may mean removing myself right. from the situation for the good of the company. So don't be afraid to start looking at your exit strategies. We're going to have to do a show on exit strategies one day because a lot of you have asked me that question and, and, and kind of like, how could you say that? This your business. It's your baby. But we're going to do a show on that another well. time. Look, what does the Bible say? Train them up so that they can what? Go. <laughs> that, includes way, <laughs> that includes our babies and our businesses. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, I've enjoyed this conversation. There's so much more that we could talk about, guys, but we really don't. It's 2.15 and we have to wind it down. And plus, I need to take some more meds because I'm not feeling well. But, you know, I enjoyed the conversation. If you guys have any questions about hiring and firing, HR, setup, uh, staffing, planning, any of that, you can reach out to myself or Stephanie. Like I said, if you want, I can send you a basic generic 
toned down version of a staffing planning form so that way you could at least have that document in place and start getting the, the ball rolling and start thinking about for when you have to hire. Don't wait until you absolutely need to hire to make that decision because that's when you make the, the worst hiring decisions and it can cost you in the end. And don't wait or drag out firing. Do the, you know, the, the probation thing, do the written warning, do the verbal warnings and all of that. Try to rectify it, but cut that piece out of your business that I don't want to use the word cancer, but cut whatever the bad element is in your business, cut it out and let it happen. You know, you got to do what's right for your business and your bottom line. So hire right and fire fast. And in between all of that, make sure you, you get somebody who knows HR that can help you. If you need a, an outside certified, call Stephanie. She can help you certified. with that. Certified. There you go. Certified. Which if you means, want help with hiring, don't call me unless it's engineering the technology. I can refer you to somebody else. But you know, if you if you need help with staffing planning, I do do that. We do consulting at the Red Shoe Agency, my other company. And you guys can, you know, give me a call and we can talk about that. But I want to thank you all for tuning in. Thank you for listening to us and, and keeping coming back and listening to our words of wisdom. And we will be back next week. So you take care and be safe and be smart. Very smart. Bye, Bye now.